How, how's the encampment been? Oh, it's been good. I think uh, you can see right now there's a lot of people here. It's uh, the energy's high, the morale is high. People are um, kind of chilling right now, but uh, we're all feeling a uh, sense of love and community, and um, we're all determined to see our demands through. How were you guys able to make it through the rain last night? Uh, I think, uh, again, just determination to see it through. You know, the rain was one factor. Threats from administration were another factor. Um, racists harassing the encampment are another factor. All of it is ultimately, I think, superseded by the urgency we feel to respond to this genocide and our institution's complicity in it. Why do you think it's so important to um, uh, act on or advocate for ending this genocide? Well, I think, um, I feel like that's a kind of self-evident answer for most people, but I think um, right now for the people in this encampment, um, beyond just like a general duty to humanity that we all feel, you know, we uh, are all increasingly aware of the material role that UVM plays in uh, funding and enabling and remaining complicit in this genocide and also general anger towards um, the administration's treatment of Palestinian students or uh, rather ignoring of them and uh, general hostility to uh, pro-Palestinian sentiment. I think uh, there's a lot of different moving parts that's kind of uh, come together and resulted in this encampment here. In what ways has UVM specifically been complicit in terms of funding and stuff? Well, so uh, our first two demands are to disclose the uh, endowment information uh, and all their investments. And the second is to divest from weapons manufacturers, Israeli companies, and companies that are complicit in the occupation of Palestine. Um, the endowment data is uh, more or less hidden from us at the moment. It's been that way for over a decade now, but last time it was publicly available information, um, they had millions of dollars in companies like Lockheed Martin, General Electric, uh, Boeing, I believe Caterpillar, um, all these companies that directly profit off of the blood of Palestinians. and. Uh, we have no reason to believe that that isn't the case now, and uh, that's what we're here to overturn. Why do you think UVM is reluctant to listen to your demands? I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, hurts their wallet. Second, there are um, political pressures at play here. Um, in. 2022, uh, the administration was sued by a Zionist law firm under a Title VI investigation that nominally invested, investigated them for uh, allowing an anti-Semitic environment on campus, but in the text of the lawsuit was targeted explicitly at pro-Palestinian activists and uh, was sort of there to pressure the university into adopting a more hostile demeanor towards uh, Palestine solidarity and uh, that ended with a resolution agreement where nominally the university didn't um, adopt any of the explicit demands of the law firm bringing it forward but you know the act in and of itself you know it's a form of lawfare to create that kind of pressure on the university. One of your demands that interested me was the academic boycott what does that entail? Yeah, so uh, that's based off of the Palestinian uh, campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Uh, that was a campaign initiated by Palestinians living under occupation in 2004 as a part of the broader BDS boycott divestment sanctions movement. For universities in America, it entails a severing of ties and partnerships between their university and Israeli academic institutions, ending of satellite campuses, academic partnerships, uh, stuff like that. I think uh, for UVM specifically, there's generally less um, coordination and partnership with uh, Israeli academic institutions, so it's not necessarily a super high 
uh, it's not necessarily a super difficult demand for them. It's more of a just uh, we want the, to see them faithfully observing the Palestinian campaign for the uh, academic and cultural boycott of Israel going forward. What is the um, encampment's uh, dislike for uh, the fi- the speaker, the um, commencement speaker, born out of? Yeah, I think I can speak not just for the encampment, but for uh, all of campus broadly right now. Uh, people are infuriated that UVM would bring such a harmful speaker to campus anytime, but especially right now, right here in this town. She's scheduled to speak uh, two blocks from where the three Palestinian boys were shot wearing their kafiyas. Um, this is a woman who has overseen and been complicit in the U.S.'s vetoing of three ceasefires in the U.N. Security Council. Every time you see the headline, UN, U.S. vetoes U.N. ceasefire resolution, there's a picture of her raising her hand. That picture carries an immense amount of pain and trauma and suffering for Palestinian students on campus. It's uh, no exaggeration to say that some of our family members are dead because of her, and for UVM to bring her to campus is a disgrace, and I think uh, that anger is being felt by everyone on campus right now, and uh, everyone's ready to resist it with urgency. So what interests me is, this occupation has been going on for a while now. Why why suddenly is there so much attention and action against it? Yeah, well, I think things have been bubbling up for a long time ever since the genocide began in October. Um, you know, people have mobilized in by the millions against it and against their government's complicity. Students have played a big role in that and Everyone across the board has just been completely ignored by their governments, by their institutions, by their politicians and representatives, by their bosses in some cases. And, uh, you know, when it's something this urgent, this um, odious, I don't know if odious is the right word, uh, this atrocious, you know, just being ignored like that is not going to make anybody go away it kind of it's kind of like a pressure cooker and then eventually the pressure reaches a point where it just explodes and this explosion of encampments we see began on columbia university and again was met with more repression university called in uh, nypd to crack down and again we saw in real time that repression on an issue like this just does not work and uh it sparked a movement across the country and across the world right now to mobilize set up these encampments and for all students at all universities to strike now and pressure their universities to end their complicity how has uh, uvm responded to this encampment um at first there was a lot of uh threats and intimidation a lot of talk of trespassing suspension um surveillance etc uh they backed off of that eventually thanks to the number of people who mobilized and uh, now they're approaching us in a more conciliatory tone and uh, we have conversations underway that we can hopefully begin some good faith negotiations in but uh, we'll see what happens do you know the deal with that camera over there yeah that is a surveillance tower that uh uvm uh police set up an hour or two ago. Um, Generally, UVM police has just kind of been itching to um, fuck with us. And I think uh, they have their own kind of demeanor that's a little bit detached from the rest of the administration because they are police at the end of the day. So uh, where it is right now, they're not going to uh, sweep us. We're prepared for that to change if it changes um but in the meantime they're doing stuff like putting up these surveillance towers um coming through every now and then it's uh not moving us is the encampment scared about any escalation from the police i wouldn't say scared i say i say we're aware of it as a possibility we are uh, prepared people are ready to mobilize in the event of a crackdown um 
and we're all aware of the risks and sacrifices that we're making by being here and again that is trumped by the duty that we have to act how do you think social media has played into awareness about this issue in ocean away i think uh, social media for all of its faults has played a very critical role in uh, disseminating information about what's actually happening because uh, social media at the end of the day is a uh, democratizing um, force of information and uh, you know for the older generations who rely on more institutional media outlets like New York Times, CNN, NPR, any of the fucking three letter names uh, you know you go on their websites on their channels and it's all very uh i want to say whitewashed yeah whitewashed you know it's um inaccurate and i think um honestly bordering on malpractice i'd say a lot of it is malpractice for some of the more right-wing outlets and uh you know you'll see stuff about the israel hamas war or the uh Hamas run Palestinian health ministry all the sorts of biased language that's meant to play on your uh, implicit um, biases against Muslims against Arabs against Palestinians and social media on the other hand that the younger generation uh, gets more of their information from that's an area where we've seen just basically a constant live stream of atrocities direct footage from the ground of children missing limbs people with their hands zip tied crushed by tanks and uh when it's that in your face when uh the things that are actually happening are that graphically apparent to you uh that results in this kind of generational gap we've seen between the anti-war younger generation and the older you get the more pro-israel pro-zionist that you, you see i notice a lot of really beautiful art um painted around around the encampment what do you think has been the impact of of art with this encampment i think uh, that's ultimately um a testament to the fact that we're here out of a place of love and compassion for humanity you know we are willing to uh throw down and take up space and disrupt that's what the encampment is doing but at the same time we are purposing all of our creative energies and all of our uh, artistic impulses into this uh, resistance effort what do you say to accusations of anti-semitism i guess it depends on who it's coming from you know uh, i've been doing this kind of work for six years and uh that's always the first thing that anybody in the movement hears that uh we hate jews we hate uh you know we're anti-semites and um past a certain point we realize that it's not coming from a place of good faith that it's coming from political motivations and political forces that seek to protect the zionist state of israel and uh sometimes it's just not something that we engage with at all i think uh in uh less common occurrences uh there are people who are genuinely concerned about uh anti-semitism maybe because uh that's just what they've been told about us i think uh you know it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis but i think there are definitely instances where we're willing to sit people down and have uh, good faith conversations with them build that relationship to show that uh we're not anti-semitic where nobody's doing this out of hatred in fact i would say uh kind of disproportionate representation of jewish people are in this movement because uh the jewish people that i've been in community with resisting this genocide by my side uh, are more galvanized than other people because they feel like this is being done in their name and uh, their trauma and their heritage is being weaponized for genocide and settler colonialism. If you have one thing to say to the outside world, what is it? We will win. I am 
um, you know, hanging around here at the encampment today. Um, beautiful day. Yesterday it was just like pouring. It was just sopping wet. Terrible out. But, you know, everything's going great. We just had a massive protest against um, Lena, Linda Thomas Greenfield, um, war criminal, works for the UN. Um, UN ambassador vetoed a cease, ceasefire twice. Um, disgusting person. Um, we also had some art builds over there, and we have some like we got a library in there for people who want to read books, and you know, just a lot of community going on. Um, a lot of just like collaboration and just a lot of love being spread here. So, yeah, um, and we're protesting, you know, UVM complicity in genocide, demanding divestment and amnesty, full amnesty for our students. Um, yeah. Um, Y'all got any questions you want to ask me? Well, you, you got a really good monologue there. Um, what's the deal with the one, it semi looks like an Israel flag with the, with the Star of David and the blue lines. What's the deal with that? Well, you know, Sometimes there's conflict here and these kinds of events, um, you know, there was a bit of a conflict with somebody who disagreed and had a lot of issues with our encampment. And, um, you know, I could tell that they were very uncomfortable here and they were very, there was like some antagonism between the rest of us here. And you know what? Um, I said, you know what? This is, you. The, you're welcome to be here. And you know, we're gonna, people are welcome to be here um we got food if you want some food um we've got water um we got some art over there and you know all this other shit and you know um he's like i want to do some art and i was like okay he was like what if i did this and i was like yeah you can make a star of david you can make the israeli flag that's on you boss it's on you i can't stop you i won't stop you um you know someone else didn't really like that bike by the way Sorry. Um, and, you know, someone didn't like it. They vandalized it. And um, I just said, like, hey, that happened. Um, but we also want to make sure everybody here is safe because that's a priority here. We want to priori prioritize safety. And, you know, they took it with a grain of salt um, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's this is about Palestine. This is about human beings, humanity, love, life. It's what it's all about. Um, and yeah, so that's something that happened and they walked away from it. I think it's chill now, but who's to say escalations happen and sometimes it depends on how you respond accordingly. Have you experienced any counter protests? No. Nah. Nah, um, there haven't been any counter protests. Um, there's been like intimidation, but you know, we have this shit on lock. I really feel comfortable about what we're doing and how our strategy is working today. Um, and you know, if there's escalation and if it gets too hot and it gets too hot and you know, I'm sure there's a valid reason behind it, um, but yeah. What has the situation with the police been so far, or the UVM on-campus security? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, um... It's so good, right? Yeah. What do you hope to be the outcome of all this? Divestment, I hope, no, sorry, I hope that all our goals and demands are met, um, and, you know, as far as I'm aware, as it stands, like, that's all that matters. Um, these are our demands. How has the leadership structure been here? Is it very hierarchical or kind of disorganized? Let me adjust my glasses for this uh, very nerdy word. Um, I feel like it's very decentralized. Um, and I feel like it's very much run by the community here. Um, and it's very much run by us. Um, and it's very much entirely for Palestine. That's what it's all about. Um, it, yeah. If you have one th thing to say to the outside world, what is it? Free Palestine, obviously.
So, how has the encampment been? Uh, it's been really good. It's been a really strong showing from students both on day one and now day two. We had our rally at 1 p.m. and our numbers increased exponentially. And now, just looking at the tents between now and yesterday, so much bigger and it's really exciting to see. Do you think the nicer weather today has been an impact on that? Yeah, I would say so. It was it was pretty dreary yesterday. It has been really nice today. It's going to be pretty dreary again, so I hope that our resolve is just as strong as it's been the past two days. What do you think the future of the camp will be? Do you think you'll expand? Um, that's not for me to decide. That's for the organizers to decide and also how many more people we can get. But I do know one thing is that we are staying up until we can't or our demands are met. So. Can you speak on the demands? Yeah, so our um, demands, including uh, UVM disclosing its financial information, uh, canceling the speaker, and a variety of other demands that can be viewed on the social medias of UVM SJP, UVM YDSA, and other organizations such as that. Do you know the pro what the process was in developing those demands? I was not as a part of the organizing circles so I I'm not I'm not really sure but definitely the revealing the the who the speaker was um, being the um, American representative to the, to the United Nations um, that was definitely a major part in this and it was the topic of our most recent rally it's what we advertised it as so yeah that was a huge part of it but yeah the organizers would know better than me what, how have you guys been getting resources? Um, just members of the community, uh, members of the encampment, outside groups have just uh, brought in supplies. We had trouble getting supplies in. The police were stopping us on day one in the beginning, but eventually they relented and now there's been a free flow of supplies and we are very well equipped, but we can always use more. I see like a big whiteboard saying um, the demands of, of resources you guys need. How has the organization structure been? Um, I think the, again, I'm not really on the organizing committee. I'm letting the organizers do the organizing and I'm just here to help any way that I can. But uh, a lot of it has been very community oriented, uh, popular discussion. Do you think that this uh, this amount of, of student organizing and, and activism is, is normal at UVM? Uh, UVM has a long history of activism on topics such as uh, on apartheid, genocide, etc. Most famously being South Africa, where they occupied buildings, and uh, so there's a there's a long precedent of students at UVM doing this, and the people of Burlington being involved in something like this. So it's very exciting to see that we're carrying on a, a legacy just such as that, and being on the right side of history here. Why do you think there's there's been so much activism now though after 20 years like I don't think we've seen anything like this Well for a lot of people October 7th was a wake-up to a conflict that has been happening for almost a hundred years now So a flashpoint such as that and we've seen this in the past with the George Floyd uh, protests These flashpoints they trigger an upwelling of mass action and when we have groups such as the UVM SJP and the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation here to corral that mass sentiment and turn it into a movement such as this one. That's how you see encampments such as this one and encampments all around the country fighting for their universities to disclose their investments and to divest from the war machine. How do you think you can stop a movement from becoming a trend? I think it takes a lot of organizing prowess, a lot of smart organizing, making sure that every, we have goals that we are always striving for, making sure we're focused on achieving those goals, and keeping the big picture in mind, keeping in mind what we're fighting for, and that what we're doing, it does matter in the grand scheme of things. I see a lot of comparisons between these sorts of um, campus protests and the ones during the Vietnam era. But what's interesting about that is that during the Vietnam, there was an actual draft, whereas with this, it feels like most students are pretty separate from the conflict. Why do you think that has, hasn't stopped students from, from doing this type of activism? Yeah, well, I think when thinking about the draft, um, a lot of college students, if I'm not mistaken, were exempt from the draft because they are attending college. That could be incorrect, but um, I would imagine that just we're fighting for more than just 
our personal stake in the conflict. We're fighting for the stake in the conflict of the people of Palestine, Palestinians living in America, and really everyone on earth that is fighting for liberation because uh, no one is liberated until everyone is liberated. So I think that whole grand concept of liberation and peace is what we're all fighting for and that's what's keeping the movement alive. I notice a lot of really beautiful art around the encampment. What's the deal with that? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely not an artist, but it is definitely all beautiful work by a lot of uh, beautiful people doing great things. If you had one thing to communicate with the world, what would it be? Um, the UVM Solidarity Encampment is not going away until our demands are met. How's the energy been at the camp? It's been really great. We've got so much support, like faculty, staff, community members. Um, there's probably at least 50 people just at the camp right now. Um, it's been great. It's been incredible. What do you think has been driving that kind of support? Um, I would say everyone. Like, it, it's not really like a specific group. Um, we're very visible. Uh, we have the Instagram and Telegram going. So um, I think I think we're really like fueling off of each other's energy. How has the communication been in the camp? Um, it's been good. Uh, we have we're we're decentralized and we make decisions together. That's one of our points of unity. Um, not no one person will speak for the entire encampment. Um, so we we want to make collective decisions. What do you think it will take to stop the encampment? Um, admin cooperation. I mean, like student power is important, but I mean, it's really the admin that can like actually get things to happen so we're really looking for admin to cooperate and negotiate if you have one thing to say to the world what is it oh um free palestine uh do what you can actually do more than what you can um look at what's happening in your community and um donate support them in any like financially um food wise just being there um anything helps how has the support been from the community this is my last question it's been great i mean we're fully stocked we we actually have like a bunch of like extra stuff that we can't use and we will be donating stuff in the end because we got notebooks and stuff and i think those can go elsewhere but um we appreciate it regardless um like this is day two and we have so much we have an abundance of like food and resources how has the energy been in the encampment oh uh, it's been a lot of energy been good energy bad energy i think right now it's low energy sometimes it's high energy people are doing a lot of work make sure that we can keep going and you know, make things more organized, putting food stuff together more, I'm trying to deal with the camera thing somehow. I think people are trying to figure out what that looks like, like covering ourselves up more or something. I don't really know what the plan is about that. I think we're going to talk about that at the assembly tonight. And yeah, there's like negotiations happening with the administration. Uh, it's hard to say what will come of that. I know there's a lot of Jewish students who are here with us and then there's also a lot of Jewish students who are standing outside of the camp and feeling unsafe about it being here and I think that is a lack of trust or willingness to communicate about their fears of what's happening here and yeah I don't know how has the response been from UVM uh, they don't want us here. I mean, they definitely don't want us here. They say it's not allowed, it's against policy. They're all for our right to protest, but just not like this, which is what they say to every protest. And so 
except for like rallies and stuff or permitted things. We didn't get a permit for this. They've been trying to get us to get a permit for that one, one half of that blue tent, blue canopy tent over there. And there's different factions. There's like the security people who are trying to play like hardball and they really want us to leave. And then there's the other administration who need to be able to keep lines of communication open with us so that it doesn't just turn into like a full on conflict. And yeah. What will the encampment do um, in regards to an escalation? An escalation by... by, by police by or by you? Uh, what, will the, what would the encampment do in response to an escalation by the encampment? Yeah, I guess. Well... Uh, okay, I'm just going to answer it in a way that makes more sense to me, but... Um, I think both sides of this encampment versus police slash administration conflict here are view what the other side is doing as an escalation while what they view themselves doing is not so like us bringing in food to feed ourselves or putting up canopy tents we see is necessary for us to be able to continue to be out here and then putting up a big ass security tower with a loudspeaker they see is necessary for for them to secure the area and I don't think either of us are going to come to an agreement about what the other side should do because we both agree that the other side should stop doing the whole point of what the thing is so I think the police would probably respond to an escalation by doing something that they think is reasonable. And I think we would respond to an escalation from the police by doing something that we think is reasonable. And I couldn't say what that is because I don't know. Depends on what that escalation is. Do you guys think you have enough food to uh, continue this encampment? Of like the dry food that we have right now? Uh, we have a crazy amount of dry food. Did y'all get a video of it? It's a lot of food. Uh, I think people are going to keep bringing in food. It seemed like yesterday the police plan was to starve us out, but I think they realize they can't do that because they don't pay their officers enough to work here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we're going to get food regardless, and we're going to stay out here regardless. And I think people are just going to keep bringing in food. So I think it's not a matter of how much food do we have right now, but how much can we keep supporting ourselves and sustaining ourselves down the line, you know, because we've had food coming in so far. If you have one thing to say to the world, what is it? Uh, free Palestine. Free Palestine. <laughs>